thanks again for, for having me. Uh, today I'll share um, some past work on uh, designing for human AI complementarity and then towards the end of the talk share a, a little bit more about current ongoing work and emerging directions. So AI systems are increasingly used to support human work in deeply social contexts, such as classroom teaching, healthcare, and social work. Uh, in these kinds of contexts, AI can automate routine parts of practitioners' work while freeing up time for activities they find more meaningful. And AI can also help practitioners make more informed decisions. Uh, but these benefits do not come without risks. So for example, the use of AI uh, risks automating away human interactions that people might not want to lose. Um, in recent years, we've seen, for example, protests around the use of AI-based learning software in schools, where the software has been viewed as diminishing social interactions and the role of the teacher in the classroom. Uh, modern AI systems are also susceptible to learning spurious patterns and harmful biases from data, and they risk propagating these biases at an unprecedented scale and speed. Uh, they lack many of the common sense or um, pro-social reasoning abilities that humans may take for granted, so they can also fail in ways that a human would not, uh, such as assigning high grades to well-structured but gibberish student essays. A long line of literature suggests that in many domains, humans and AI systems have complementary abilities and limitations. Uh, while the gap may narrow over time, many skills and occupations, such as uh, those involving uh, forms of care work, may fundamentally defy automation. So to realize the benefits of AI and to mitigate its risks, it's critical that we design to take advantage of what humans do best, while also helping humans overcome their own limitations. Uh, in my research, I explore how we might design systems that draw upon the complementary strengths and try to mitigate respective biases of human and AI decision makers. The design of human AI partnerships has been explored across a range of domains, uh, but experiments evaluating their performance have shown mixed results. Several studies show that when humans and AI systems work together, this can improve decision-making compared with either humans or AI uh, making decisions alone. And so for example, successful partnerships have been demonstrated between human experts and AI systems in radiology as well as other domains. But if not designed carefully, human AI collaborations can fail to improve or even hurt decision-making. So, why do some human AI partnerships succeed while others fail? Oftentimes, it's a simple lack of human-centered design. Uh, for example, a partnership might fail when humans can't understand what the AI system is telling them, uh, though where that would be important for it to succeed. Other times, it might be ineffective pairing. Uh, so for example, many null or negative results in this area have come from studies on crowdsourcing platforms like Amazon's Mechanical Turk, where crowd workers might be assigned to assist an AI on tasks that truly require expert level domain knowledge, which we wouldn't expect an average crowd worker to have. So there's no reason to believe upfront that the humans and AI system would have complementary strengths. And there are various other re uh, reasons uh, why human AI partnerships might fail, um, which I know is also an, an active area of investigation uh, in my lab, as well as based on the conversations I've had today um, among various people at Stanford currently. So to design effective human AI partnerships, we need to engage with the specific context where AI is used and to understand the capabilities and needs of the humans involved in those real world contexts. In my group, we take a participatory approach throughout all stages of building human AI systems. So we start by developing collaborative research partnerships with relevant stakeholders. We then work to engage these stakeholders throughout the entire design and development lifecycle for new technologies, uh, ranging from initial need finding and ideation to design decisions about the underlying algorithms and uh, uh, ranging to deployment of these systems in the field. And when working with data-driven AI systems today, 
This often requires the development of new design and prototyping methods. For example, to help stakeholders understand and shape algorithmic elements of a uh, new systems design. Using the outputs of these co-design processes, uh, we typically strive to conduct field experiments uh, later in the process to understand the dynamics and causal impacts of these human AI systems in the wild. So in this talk, I'll share two major themes of my research. Um, first, I've explored how to co-design more effective human AI partnerships. And second, uh, we've explored how to support fair decision-making within such partnerships. And for the sake of time, uh, today I'll share just one prior project um, under each of these broad themes. But I'm also excited to close this talk by sharing some ongoing research in my group. So I'll start with some work I've done in K-12 education, where we developed an effective form of human AI partnership. First, for a, a bit of context, in recent years, there's been a push on K-12 teachers to implement more personalized classrooms in which students work at their own pace, while the teacher's role is transformed from that of a lecturer at the front of the class to more of an active facilitator of students' learning. To enable more personalized instruction, we're seeing greater adoption of AI-based educational software. So uh, as an example, intelligent tutoring systems provide students uh, with step-by-step -step guidance through problem-solving activities. They can adapt instruction to individual students based on real-time models of students' behavior, their knowledge, and even their effective states. And they've been demonstrated in several meta-reviews to enhance student learning compared with other forms of classroom instruction. Thinking back, uh, during my first year in graduate school, I spent over 100 hours observing a wide range of classrooms using these AI tutors. Um, and in most of the classrooms, I observed the teacher constantly moving throughout the room and holding brief one-on-one -on -one help sessions with their students. So in practice, AI tutors and human teachers really work together to help students learn. But the role of the teacher in these AI-supported classrooms has historically been understudied. And this partnership arguably isn't working as well as it could. So for instance, it's difficult for teachers to monitor classes of 15 to 30 students who are all working at their own pace, uh, with each student potentially working on entirely different material within the software. Many of uh, the teachers I've worked with have noted feeling left out of the loop in their own classrooms during class sessions using these AI tutors. Uh, but bringing human teachers back into the loop could have a great impact. Uh, so for example, events regularly occur uh, in a typical K-12 classroom that a, a human teacher might ultimately be best suited to deal with. Students might get frustrated uh, find ways to game the system um, with getting through the material without uh, necessarily learning. Other students may be missing key prerequisite knowledge, maybe from prior grade levels, which lies entirely outside of the instructional scope of the software. So in this project, we explored how AI-based software and K-12 teachers might work together more effectively during a class session allowing human teachers and AI to build upon each other's complementary strengths rather than trying to automate what human teachers may already do best. To this end, we worked closely with a set of 36 core middle school math teachers in the Pittsburgh area who were already using AI tutoring software in their classrooms, often for many years, in some cases for over a decade. And um, I'll give you an overview of this work, ranging from our earliest uh, design explorations. Can you say what software they're using? Are they using like Carnegie Learning um, software or what? Yeah, absolutely. So a, a range of software, um, Carnegie Learning, uh, Assistments, um, in some cases, Alex. The majority of the teachers, although only a slight majority, were learn using Carnegie Learning, so cognitive tutors. 
going from uh, iterative code design and prototyping with teachers, I'll also talk about uh, the classroom evaluation of a new tool that emerged from all of these efforts, um, which is a set of mixed reality smart glasses for teachers called Lumalo, uh, which at this point has been used in uh, over 50 middle school classrooms. So we started this research by first getting a sense of the uh, challenges that teachers currently face in orchestrating these AI supported classrooms. When we first started this work, various researchers in this area had begun pointing out that the choices of analytics um, in existing teacher facing tools often appeared to be influenced more by existing technical feasibility than by an analysis of teachers needs. So for example, many existing like the number of times that students have clicked on a certain um, uh, button within the interface. But this sort of information was not necessarily uh, particularly helpful, found helpful by teachers. So we wanted to, in light of that, begin this project with a thorough need, need finding phase span, a range of design activities, including field observations in K-12 classrooms, uh, directed storytelling to understand teachers' past experiences using AI in the classroom, as well as card sorting and speed dating studies. And so I won't go into um, uh, detail about all of these studies here, but uh, more detail can be found in these, these papers at the bottom of the slide. Just to provide one example, in an early study, we wanted to know if teachers could have any information they wanted about their students in real time, what would this be? And to do this without overly biasing teachers towards ideas that they thought were already technologically possible, we asked teachers what superpowers they would want in these AI-supported classrooms in order to help them better do their jobs. Among several other superpowers, we found that teachers consistently wanted to be able to instantly see when students were unproductively struggling and might truly need a teacher's help and also to see students' thought processes unfolding in real time as they work through math problems, for instance. In a follow-up series of speed dating studies with teachers, in which teachers are presented with uh, fictional scenarios presented in, in rapid succession, we found that teachers were particularly drawn to concepts that would allow them to see actionable information about students' learning in real time while still keeping their heads up and their eyes focused on the classroom, since so much of the rich information that teachers gain is from actively looking at their students, so their faces, their body language. So for example, this early concept sketch shows the AI software essentially raising a student's hand for them when it detects that the student currently seems to need help, um, perhaps for a, a, a a long period of time, even if they're not asking for help. So to complement these sorts of investigations of teachers' own perceived needs, we also wanted to study the interplay between teacher and student behavior in actual uh, AI-supported classrooms to identify needs that teachers might not themselves be consciously aware of. So for example, in one study, we collected AI log data and field observations from classrooms. Uh, by exploring these data sets through replay visualizations and causal modeling, uh, we were able to identify some initial opportunities for these sorts of teacher analytics tools to have a positive impact in the classroom. So as one example, although most teachers believe that they prioritize students in their classes who um, need their help the most while using the software. In reality, they mostly meet with students who raise their hands most frequently, not the students who are silently struggling. So moving towards designing an actual system uh, based on uh, these insights, we wanted to get a more concrete sense beyond these superpower ideas of what real-time information would be most helpful to K-12 teachers while also getting a better sense of how they might actually use this information to inform decision making. And uh, in this process, we also decided to explore this idea of teacher smart glasses further. So the use of wearable devices like smart glasses for real-time teacher support um, at this point was only just beginning to be explored. 
and prior work had rarely made the link from um, choices of analytics to teacher actions that they might actually uh, inform in practice. So to explore some of these questions further, we conducted an iterative series of design and prototyping studies, working with teachers in their own classrooms at their schools. As an example from this phase of the work, in low fidelity experience prototyping sessions, teachers would put on plastic eyeglass frames and would look at a scene of a classroom on a computer screen. When teachers put the glasses on, we would Wizard of Oz analytics uh, overlaid on the classroom image. And these analytics were based directly on the sorts of superpowers that teachers had requested previously. We also invited teachers to edit the information that they saw through their glasses. So whenever a teacher would generate an idea for new information, we would press them to explain how they envisioned actually using that information. And we found that asking that, that question um, would often lead teachers to refine their ideas, which were then incorporated into the version shown to the next teacher. Uh, after uh, encouraging feedback from these prototyping sessions, we next moved to higher fidelity experience prototyping um, using the Microsoft HoloLens. During each study session, we placed holograms throughout a teacher's physical classroom, and we were able to modify these holograms in near real time based on a teacher's live design feedback by editing images that were synced with the app uh, while the teachers viewed these through the, the HoloLens. Teachers also had the opportunity to experiment with decorating their classrooms with different combinations of information displays while thinking aloud and providing design feedback. So if you're interested in learning more about this mixed reality prototyping process, um, you can check out uh, the Medium blog linked here or these research articles, which describe it in more detail. So by this point in the process, uh, out of a very large initial design space, we'd converged to a compact set of real-time indicators that appeared to be most useful to teachers. And these included um, what teachers believed were key moments for them to step in and intervene. Uh, for example, when a student is misusing the software in some way, or when a student is unlikely to learn their current material by working with the AI tutor alone. We also settled on um, two displays that would pop up when a teacher clicks on an individual student's indicator. So for example, if the AI tutor diagnoses that a student is struggling with particular skills, the teacher's glasses would display both the skill and some concrete examples of recent errors that the student made. And these concrete examples were really important to teachers. So teachers would often use them to second guess the AI tutor's diagnoses and to try to infer underlying causes of the student's difficulties. So we next began developing a fully functional prototype called Lumalo. In this case, instead of Wizard of Ozing the analytics as before, now analytics would be streamed live from AI tutors to the teacher's glasses. And here you can see uh, Lumalo in action with an off-task student. In addition, teachers could click on individual students to peek at the um, more detailed information. So before bringing this prototype into actual uh, K-12 classrooms, many open design questions remained. But to support co-design and prototyping at higher fidelity, we needed to create a number of new design and prototyping methods to address challenges in working with data-driven AI systems. Uh, so for example, uh, we wanted to involve teachers not just in high level design decisions about the kinds of information to be presented, but also in, in helping to shape the specific algorithms that were used to drive Lumalo's analytics. So we developed a new prototyping method called replay enactments. Uh, replay enactments embed participants in immersive simulations based on replays of actual data from field contexts. 
in order to help make the consequences of particular algorithm design decisions more tangible to stakeholders, even if they know very little about AI. During a session, a human wizard makes live changes to algorithmic elements of a system's design based on stakeholder feedback. Uh, for example, the parameters of a machine learned model. This allows stakeholders to experience the consequences of their requested changes and then to rapidly iterate with the wizard. So for instance, um, in the Lumilo project, Teachers worked with the wizard to experiment with different specifications for Lumilo's learning analytics. We invited teachers into a school computer lab, and there were no students present, but instead we simulated a class session from historical data so that if the teacher looked at the computer screens, it looked as if there were students working, although ghost students in this case. And teachers could then experience the consequences of particular design decisions they'd asked for while wearing Lumilo and moving throughout the lab space. If you're interested in seeing some actual clips from uh, some of these sessions, you can find them at this link. So replay enactments is one response to uh, recent calls in the HCI and design communities for new kinds of prototyping methods for data-driven AI systems. By using authentic data and algorithms, replay enactments can help reveal critical issues that conventional Wizard of Oz studies can't surface. For example, uh, the interplay between human decision making and a prototype's false positives and negatives. And by conducting these sessions in simulated classrooms first, we gave teachers a space to iterate without risking harm to students. So at this point, we, we're ready to move into actual. Ensure that the version of Lumilo we'd co-designed with teachers was likely to have a positive impact. When we started this work, there were no principled approaches out there for ensuring the educational effectiveness of uh, teacher analytics tools like Lumilo. So we developed a data-driven design approach called Causal Alignment Analysis, or CAA for short. Applying CAA in the iterative design of Lumilo meant first making our hypotheses about Lumilo's mechanisms of action explicit, and then iteratively prototyping Lumilo with teachers and students. During classroom pilots, we tracked what teachers did and how they allocated their time during class sessions. Uh, with this data, we used a causal modeling approach to evaluate whether the tool seemed to be having desirable effects with respect to our theory of change, uh, but also to evaluate whether the theory of change itself uh, seemed appropriate. So using CAA, we iteratively refined Lumilo over four pilot studies. And in the end, the resulting version of Lumilo actually appeared to direct teachers' attention where it was most needed in the classroom. These pilot studies in actual classrooms also grew our understanding of how this human AI partnership might play out in the real world. So a major theme was that teachers did indeed make decisions uh, based on complementary data sources they had access to. In the moment, they would combine what they saw with their own eyes and ears with what the AI system was telling them about their students. And this often played out in interesting ways. So in one particularly memorable case, Lumilo alerted the teacher that a particular seventh grader might be off task in the software. But based on what the teacher knew about this student, uh, they thought that this was a bit strange and out of character. So rather than taking the alert at face value, the teacher initiated a conversation with the student and asked how the student was feeling that day. And the student ended up revealing that their girlfriend had broken up with them the weekend before. So this teacher in turn gave the student permission to take the day off from math if they wanted to. Well, this is an extreme example in some ways um, compared to many of the other observations um, we had. It, it does illustrate one form of complementarity on the ground. 
uh, the AI diagnosed a student behavior and alerted the teacher, but the teacher then made a rich inference about the underlying cause of the behavior and responded with support and flexibility that an AI tutor could not provide. So piloting Lubelo in 30 middle school classrooms provided an opportunity to collect many other rich observations, including students' perspectives on the experience of having, um, as one student put it, a cyborg teacher. At the end of each classroom pilot using Lumelo, we conducted whole class feedback sessions. In general, Lumelo was very well received by both teachers and students, but we also observed pretty strong tensions between teachers' desires for augmentation versus students' desires. So unfortunately, I don't have time to dig into the student side of the story um, in this talk, which would take us into a, an entirely new project. Um, but you can learn more in this paper at the bottom, uh, where we developed a co-design method called participatory speed dating to promote a form of iterative design negotiation among different groups of stakeholders. So using this method, uh, students and teachers were able to reflect on one another's perspectives regarding issues such as privacy and control agency in the classroom. And they iteratively generated new design solutions to resolve conflicting perspectives. So finally, we conducted a field experiment with Lumelo to evaluate its effects on student learning. We wanted to investigate the hypothesis that this form of teacher AI partnership, directing teachers' attention to situations that the AI tutor might be poorly suited to handle, would enhance student learning. Compared with uh, business as usual in an AI-supported classroom, in which the teacher does not have real-time analytics, and also compared with a weaker form of classroom monitoring support, where the teacher can see what's on students' screens through their glasses, but without any uh, analytics. So we wanted to use this second stronger control condition because prior empirical findings suggest that students' mere awareness that a teacher is monitoring their activities may have a significant effect on their learning. And we wanted to tease apart the effect of real-time analytics over and above any such motivational or novelty effects. From a practical perspective, this is also an interesting control because it resembles the level of support that's provided by many existing classroom management systems, with which several of the teachers we'd work with were already quite familiar. So to test these hypotheses, we conducted a three condition experiment with 343 middle school students across 18 classrooms, eight teachers, and four schools and school districts. Students worked with Lynette for this study, which is a tutor for linear equation solving in algebra. And this is a, a cognitive tutor, uh, much like the Carnegie Learning System. And all teachers uh, in the study had previous experience using AI tutors in their classrooms and had at least five years of experience teaching math at a middle school level. Since the experimental treatment in this case is classroom wide, we randomly assigned classrooms to one of three conditions stratifying within teacher. The no glasses condition was business as usual for one of these AI supported classrooms where teachers would circulate throughout the room uh, without any form of support or augmentation. By contrast, in the glasses condition, the teacher wore a stripped down version of the smart glasses, which did not show any analytics. However, teachers could still click on individual students to see what was on the student's screen at the moment. And finally, in the glasses plus analytics condition, the teacher used the full version of Lumelo with all of its analytics displays. The procedure was then the same for all three conditions. Students first took a pretest. Students then worked with Lynette for two class sessions while the teacher monitored the class and helped their students. And finally, students took a post test. In addition to students' pre and post test scores, we tracked individual student process data 
in the AI tutoring software. And we also used Lumilo to track the teacher's physical activity in the classroom. So I developed a, a logging library for Lumilo, enabling it to double as a powerful data collection device to track teacher behavior during a class session. For example, the indicators um, floating above each student's head would essentially double as proximity sensors to track a teacher's physical position in the classroom relative to each student moment by moment. Finally, we used hierarchical linear modeling to analyze student learning outcomes, finding that three level models had the best fit. So the results supported the hypothesis that this form of teacher AI partnership enhances student learning compared with business as usual for AI supported. Breaking this down a bit, uh, part of the benefit of a teacher's use of Lumilo was due to their use of the glasses, even without any advanced analytics. However, a teacher's use of real-time analytics had a positive effect on student learning above and beyond any effects of the classroom monitoring support that was provided in the glasses condition. To better understand the mechanisms by which this effect may have arisen, uh, I looked at how teachers' allocation of time across students of varying prior knowledge um, was influenced by uh, the experimental condition. And I found that compared with the two other conditions, when teachers had access to real-time analytics about their students, they tended to spend much more of their time working with students who had come in with lower prior knowledge. In turn, I found that providing teachers with real-time analytics served to shrink achievement gaps within the classroom compared with business as usual for an AI-supported classroom. For students in both the glasses and no glasses conditions, we saw the rich get richer effects that are often observed with classroom use of cognitive tutors. Students coming in with higher prior ability tend to benefit more from working with the tutoring software. However, for students in the glasses plus analytics condition, the post-test by pre-test curve was flatter than in the other two conditions. Meaning that when teachers had access to real-time analytics about their students, lower pre-test students learned more. Finally, I looked at how a teacher's use of Lumilo affected students' behaviors. And for this purpose, I looked at the very same student behaviors that Lumilo tracks. Interestingly, some of the largest effects of Lumilo on the frequency of these student behaviors can be attributed to the simpler classroom monitoring support that was provided in the glasses condition. So a plausible explanation for this is that uh, when students believe that their teacher has magic eyeglasses that let them see everything they're doing in the software, the frequency of the very behaviors that Lumilo was designed to detect goes down. So one key takeaway of this is that future studies on teacher analytics tools like Lumilo uh, should try to tease apart the effects of the analytics themselves from other potential impacts of a student knowing that they're being monitored, as we did here. In summary, I found that when teachers and AI work together using Lumilo, students learn significantly more than they would working with an AI tutoring system alone. Presenting teachers with real-time analytics about student learning, metacognition, and behavior at a glance served as a sort of equalizing force in the classroom, helping to narrow the gap in learning outcomes between students who were coming in with higher versus lower prior knowledge. And although there's been a lot of interest in teacher analytics tools, this is actually the, the first experimental study to demonstrate that real-time teacher analytics can enhance students' learning outcomes, which is really exciting. So Lumilo is an example of a successful human AI partnership uh, achieved through co-design with practitioners in a real world context. Next, I'll share how I've applied uh, the start of a similar research approach towards a second theme in my research, supporting humans and AI systems in drawing upon each other's complementary strengths to make fairer decisions. I've talked a little bit about how AI can help humans make fair decisions. 
For example, Lumilo helped teachers distribute their time more equitably across students. But AI systems can also exhibit undesirable biases of their own. So for instance, uh, real-time analytics in a teacher tool might have greater accuracy for some populations of students while producing misleading outputs for students from minority groups. Or an automated essay scoring system might learn to grade certain students poorly because of the particular dialect they use rather than necessarily the underlying quality of their writing. So next, I'll share some work I've done towards helping humans improve fairness in AI systems. This was a collaboration with a group of machine learning researchers at Microsoft Research, investigating industry product teams' needs for support in creating fairer machine learning systems. By unfairness in machine learning, I mean very broadly, uh, cases where systems favor certain individuals or groups over others in systemic undesirable ways. So we've already seen some examples in education, but there've been many high profile cases across uh, many domains at this point. And these kinds of algorithmic horror stories are making their way into the news with increasing regularity. A range of academic research disciplines have picked up on this. And there's been a huge surge of papers on fairness in machine learning. We've also seen many high level calls to action in the field aimed at those responsible for developing and maintaining these systems or for regulating their use at a policy level. And beyond these calls to action, a lot of machine learning research has focused on the development of algorithmic methods to monitor and mitigate undesirable biases in machine learning systems. As this field matures, we're starting to see the creation of developer toolkits where developers can input their data and models, and the toolkit will generate a bias report based on fairness metrics that exist in the literature. So these toolkits take existing algorithmic fairness methods from machine learning and try to push them into use in the real world. But if we want real world adoption of fairness research, it's crucial that this work is informed by an understanding of actual needs for support of the practitioners who will ultimately use them. Despite widespread attention to biases and unfairness in machine learning, practitioner-centered studies historically have been very rare. So in this work, we conducted the first systematic investigation in the literature of industry product teams' needs for support in developing fairer machine learning systems. We wanted to investigate what went wrong in the kinds of disaster stories that I mentioned earlier and how we might better support practitioners in avoiding these kinds of incidents. A major challenge in this work was in gaining product teams trust. We specifically sampled teams who had received negative press coverage about their AI products. So in some sense, they had every reason not to talk openly with us. Practitioners were used to others critiquing products from the outside rather than engaging with product teams to try to solve problems collaboratively. So shifting to a collaborative mindset was key to developing trust in this context, just as it was in my prior work with K-12 teachers. We conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with members of 25 product teams across 10 major technology companies. And our aim in these interviews was to better understand teams' current practices around fair machine learning at critical decision points. For each major decision point, we asked participants to recall specific challenges they'd faced and to describe how they'd handled them at the time. And we also probed participants' needs for additional support in such moments. Finally, we supplemented our interviews with an anonymous survey of 267 participants who work on ML-based products in a range of roles, including data scientists, UX researchers, data labelers, and product managers, among others. So our, our meta takeaway from this work was that there were indeed major disconnects between the research literature on fairness and machine learning and industry teams' actual needs for support. And this misalignment between research and practice was much like the disconnects that I'd observed in my uh, work with teachers between the types of information provided by existing learning analytics systems versus teachers' actual information needs. 
So given limited time, I'll uh, summarize just a few of the themes that emerged from this work. Product teams often reported struggling to make use of existing quantitative fairness metrics. In other words, the problem was often not that these teams lacked access to fair machine learning research, but rather that fair machine learning research addressed different problems than the ones they were facing. As one example of this, although most existing fair ML methods presume access to demographic data at an individual level, several of the teams we spoke with are only able to collect demographics at coarser levels, such as neighborhood or organizational level statistics. And this is for legal reasons in some cases. For example, in the United States, you generally cannot collect individual demographics of K-12 students. Another of our most striking findings in the study was on the role of data. So the FAIR machine learning literature generally assumes that data sets are pre-existing and fixed. The focus is then on designing FAIR models or algorithms to optimize quantitative fairness criteria. In contrast, industry practitioners often have some control over their data sets, especially at larger companies. And this is the first place they're likely to turn when uh, attempting to address fairness issues. So several interviewees voice needs for tools that can help actively guide their data collection efforts. For example, the quote shown here is from a machine learning developer who works on automated essay scoring applications for K-12 students. To collect their training data, their company gathers examples of student essays that are graded by teachers. But they found that in the data their team collects, African-American students rarely receive high scores from teachers. And in turn, their models end up replicating these biases in subtle ways. So the team wants to find cost-effective ways to collect more balanced representative data sets in the first place. As a third major theme, interviewees often expressed anxieties about their own blind spots as individuals and as teams. So for example, the fair machine learning literature uh, will typically assume that the subpopulations we want to be fair towards are known or even defined by law. In contrast, many practitioners worried that they have blind spots here and expressed needs for support in identifying which subpopulations to consider in the first place. Some teams reported uh, having a practice of getting together with a whiteboard and trying to imagine everything that could possibly go wrong with a particular system so that they could make sure to monitor for those issues in advance. Uh, but inevitably, once a system is deployed, particularly when it's deployed globally, the public discovers issues that the team failed to anticipate. So for these reasons, participants noted that it would be nice to somehow pool knowledge of potential pitfalls across teams with different cultural backgrounds who may have complementary knowledge as well as complementary blind spots. And one way to facilitate this might be to create mechanisms for greater sharing of test sets across organizational boundaries, which encode nuanced knowledge that no single team is likely to have. Some interviewees also shared stories about their own cultural blind spots as, as teams. So for example, we spoke with one team that was working on a globally deployed image captioning system that uh, purports to recognize celebrities from around the world. The team received many complaints from non-US based users since the system seemed to work well for US celebrities while misidentifying or misgendering celebrities from their countries. So the All-American team had great data on American celebrities like Beyonce, but when it came to celebrities from Taiwan or Korea, the team members had trouble telling different celebrities apart. And as a result, they often made errors when curating the data sets. One promising direction for future research in this space may be to support teams in the ad hoc recruitment of diverse team external human experts for particular tasks, where in some cases here, relevant expertise may simply mean being immersed in a particular cultural context at a particular time. So while I was only able to summarize a handful of findings from this work today, uh, many more are covered in our Kai paper. When we started this project, participatory approaches to work on fairness and machine learning were rare. Uh, the practitioners we worked with expressed appreciation for having their voices heard, 
rather than simply having researchers and the media critique their products from the outside. Working alongside product teams and really engaging with the particulars of specific products can raise interesting design and technical challenges. And in turn, this can productively guide more basic research and theoretical work in machine learning. Uh, building on our findings from this work, we developed a research agenda for future collaborations between HCI and machine learning researchers, which centers on supporting the humans involved throughout the AI development pipeline. And it's been really exciting to see uptake of this agenda by others in the field over the last few years. Um, this research agenda has also directly informed a lot of the ongoing work in uh, my group. So on that note, before we open for discussion, I thought I'd kind of briefly share some of the directions we're working on currently. My group at CMU, the Koala Lab, uh, focuses broadly on studying and designing new forms of human AI collaboration. Um, in particular, a lot of our projects focus on care-based, social, and creative forms of work. We're interested in helping humans and AI systems better assess, inform, and potentially contest or disagree with each other's decisions. And to do this work, we're working across various real world contexts where AI systems are already being used to guide really high stakes impactful decisions, such as social work, education, mental health care, and software design and development. We're particularly interested in designing tools to empower workers in contexts where AI has the potential to help, but which fundamentally resist full automation. And these include many care-based professions where human empathy and relationship building are central. But despite resistance to automation, care-based labor remains chronically undervalued. We can see this with underpaid and overworked social workers, school teachers in K-12, and caregivers for children, uh, the elderly, and people with disabilities. Uh, one current project we're working on under this theme focuses on co-designing algorithmic systems and platforms to empower in-home caregivers, which is currently one of the fastest growing segments of the American workforce. Um, increasingly, we're seeing companies introducing new algorithmic systems to transform what in-home care work looks like. But many of these systems tend to be designed in ways that center the needs of clients and employers while further disempowering the caregivers themselves. So in this project, we're working with caregivers to co-design new worker-centered prototypes, uh, for example, fair scheduling algorithms, interactive voice assistance, and community platforms that support knowledge sharing and collective action. Another set of projects we're working on focuses on the design and empirical evaluation of new tools to help machine learning practitioners assess and address unfairness in the systems they develop. So following up on the research agenda that I mentioned previously. For example, in one ongoing project, we're designing interventions to address problems rooted in organizational and team behavior at companies. Our aim is to work with industry practitioners to redesign existing fairness toolkits, like I mentioned earlier. So these toolkits are commonly tailored for use by machine learning developers, and their designs provide little opportunity for input or collaboration with other team members. So we're exploring uh, design opportunities to instead promote more collaborative work practices where UX researchers, social scientists, and others with relevant expertise for thinking about fairness have a seat at the table. In uh, one more uh, ongoing project um, I'll mention and then I'll wrap up, uh, we're creating and empirically evaluating a new collective auditing platform. So our goal in this project is to empower everyday users of algorithmic systems, in addition to crowd workers, um, to surface unfair or harmful algorithmic behaviors as early as possible, uh, whether to product teams or to uh, advocacy groups or so forth. And this project aims to overcome limitations that we've observed in our prior work with product teams existing practices for user testing or auditing their own systems. So that was just uh, kind of a quick overview of, of some directions we're pursuing now. Um, you can check out our website for more information and to learn more about the many students and collaborators that I have to thank for making any of this work possible. 
Um, also, beyond today's discussion, uh, feel free to reach out via um, my email is here as well as my uh, Twitter handle. So thank you. Thank you, Ken. Excellent. So panelists, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves and ask questions if you'd like. Uh, we also have some questions from folks who are uh, attendees. Uh, panelists, does anyone want to jump in first? OK, then I will. Um, so we have a, um, uh, a student uh, asking, she mentioned, you mentioned that convincing these machine learning research uh, practitioners to engage and collaborate with you was really difficult. So how did you build that rapport and how did you build that trust? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, I, I guess kind of thinking back, um, coming from a lot of work that I've been doing in the education space, I was a little taken aback by, although in retrospect, I'm not sure why this was that surprising, um, at how long it took to uh, get started on that research, how long it took to, to build those partnerships compared to how long it would typically take to build relationships with school admins, teachers, uh, students, parents, and so forth. Um, uh, it was an iterative process of um, learning the wrong ways to do it. Uh, over time, we essentially um, tried to understand um, a practitioner's concerns uh, tried to understand concerns of legal departments through some conversations there as well um, and uh, started including more language in our emails to really try to assure uh, our emails and our communications where we'd have quick follow-up calls um, that our goal here is not to write a call-out paper. We are not going to work with you and then write a CHI paper or, or some other conference paper in which we're talking about all of the problems in uh, your particular product we are trying to actually understand your processes to improve those processes. That was one important piece. The second was definitely um, uh, setting up clear processes for review, making sure that the practitioners and anyone else at their company who might need to would be able to review any direct quotes that we include um, in, in papers and to review the ways in which we were uh, de-identifying particular companies or particular teams within companies. Thanks. And wondering, how do the anti-bias anti and fairness designs gain traction without violating equal protection? Or if you have thoughts on that kind of trade-off. Yeah. So are you thinking about kind of broadly in, in this space, just fairness interventions in, in general? I think that's the question, but it's not my question. So I can't exactly clarify. I, I think maybe maybe the right thing is to say, there's just discussions around equal protections and uh, fairness and so on. So I guess asking for your, your thoughts, having been really in this space for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that is a real tension in some domains, definitely more than others. Um, and uh, in projects we're kind of getting off the ground now, uh, I mentioned one of the ongoing projects is working within a team. So looking at uh, interactions between say UX researchers and developers and product managers on another project that's just getting off the ground now, um, we're looking at the, a broader ecosystem, including internal uh, legal experts, like the ones that we were negotiating with to get access to um, practitioners for co-design work in the first place, um, to try to understand uh, the processes by which uh, these trade-offs are negotiated and how they navigate. Um, in, in many cases, competing objectives in the fairness space when working on actual products. Whether the analytics you used in um, Luminlo were limited to quantifiable situations, as, as you put it, like taking tests, and was wondering how representative those kinds of situations are of learning more broadly, sort of like what can and can't this help with? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I would say by definition, kind of the analytics are limited to quantifiable uh, situations. Uh, or actually, maybe I, I'm misinterpreting the question a bit. So, so I, 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 if I understand correctly, I think you might be thinking about kind of asking about whether um, the constructs being measured, the sorts of things that that we're that we're getting at, are limited to a, a fairly um, small scope. I think that's absolutely true, and um, I, I do. I will give a shout out to. Um, there is a lot of work in the area of learning analytics, um, AI, and education that tries to expand that scope. Um, but when it comes to, for example, um, affect detection, uh, uh, or, uh, it tends to be the case that our, our 
best models are pretty bad compared to human performance, at least if the human has um, has certain stimuli available to them that they would have in a classroom environment and is attending to a student in the moment, which are strong assumptions. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think the short answer, I'm not sure if I'm completely answering the question, is absolutely, it tends to be the case that, um, and there's, there's a broader discussion within the AI ethics for education space about the ways in which the constructs that are most easily measurable might limit um, the sorts of things that we and uh, maybe more importantly teachers on the ground end up attending to given that that's what makes its way into tools um, and, and thinking about the ethical implications of that potential narrowing so that's something that i think about a lot not just in education honestly but in every domain that i work in including social work any projects in healthcare this is really a broader problem okay i'll, I'll jump in with a question um, <laughs> In Lumilo, it seemed like you did the co-design with the teachers and not so much with the students. Um, I, you mentioned that um, one effect of um, your study with the students was that when the teacher had the glasses on, the students knew um, you know, they were being watched. Um, I'm, I'm curious about other feedback. Um, that you got from the students and, and if you can anticipate, um, if you could do co-design with the students, um, might there be ways where they could articulate how I can be supported in this, you know, um, learning system that sometimes works for me and sometimes I have difficulty with? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I'm gonna actually bring us back to this slide. So we, um, I'm actually going to say a regret. I, I, I regret not uh, working with, this is actually a different way of working than, uh, than I typically do now in projects for the most part. Typically now, I think if I were doing this project, I would try to involve students more at an earlier stage. One of the reasons we did this at the time is that a major gap in the literature is that so much work had been focusing on AI for students. And so we were interested in filling this gap and hearing teacher perspectives. Um, the slide I'm showing here is a piece that I, a piece of the story that I uh, didn't really get to talk about today, which is the co-design with students. Um, and again, I, I feel like in retrospect, we, we brought this in a little bit too late, but we learned a lot um, through this process. And it was uh, actually one of my favorite parts of this project from a participatory design methods perspective, in which we were iteratively um, kind of facilitating these iterative negotiations between teachers and students having them generate new designs, critique each other's designs, talk about what's insensitive about a design created by teachers, but which teachers feel are really enhancing their abilities. Um, and so uh, in this paper uh, shown at the bottom, we talk about a lot of the concerns that students had, um, the reasons why teachers um, felt strongly about having some of those designs. Ultimately, we were for the most part able to get to a place where um, we would alleviate uh, any major concern students had, for example, venturing into the territory of affect detection, um, really, really went into the creepiness territory for students, whereas other analytics that we had, students would actually agree, oh, it seems helpful for my teacher to know that. Um, and so we were exploring some of those uh, tensions. But by the end of this process, uh, we got to a place where uh, students uh, were happy with the design and, uh, teachers, even though they might be disappointed that some features they wanted were not in there, um, we're, still, we're still overall happy with the design. So this was really a, a process of navigating trade-offs. And that I should mention, um, not all of these changes, the majority of these changes were not reflected in the version that we tried in the classroom study. I, and that's, that's where some of my regrets come in of, had we started this process earlier, more of these uh, design changes would have, uh, we would have been reflecting student and teacher needs a bit, a bit more in the um, experimental study that I covered. Excellent. I'm noting we're at time, so why don't we end it here? Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, everyone, please silently clap with your videos yeah. on or off. Thank you and, for um, having me. Yes.